there's another little section here um, that I added that I think it's um, yeah. huh? I think it's a it's a, it's, a, it's interesting to talk about this distinction uh, community versus networks um, the whole idea here is you know how you distinguish them along these these uh, um, dimensions of proximity among members um, sense of uh, belonging, um, identity. How how do you identify with identify with with that network or, or community or cluster of people, and and the culture. Um, for example, communities. You know, there's more proximity. Uh, people identify with these communities. They have a strong sense of belonging, and the communities create strong cultures. And the networks are more loose. Uh, people don't know each other. Uh, they don't really identify, they don't have necessarily a sense of belonging, it's, it's just a, a mutual benefit type of thing. Uh, Bitcoin, you know, so how, do, so how do you position yourself as a, as, as a, as a collaborative entrepreneur? Yeah. Uh, how do you build an organization? It, it, does it feel like a network or does it feel more like a community? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Um, and, 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 you know, some, somehow the, <laughs> the outreach or how you reach out to people uh, depends on that kind of positioning. If it's more a network, it's just utilitarian. Okay, it's utility based. Okay, you come here to get a service. If you if you want to create a community, uh, it's it's uh, it gives you a purpose, a sense of belonging. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's a place for you to be with others, right? And and share a purpose rather than just a, ut a simple utility. And there is a whole continuum among these things, yeah. right? <clears throat> I find it interesting that uh, practical when it started, it was community network. That it's, it was like a, a bit of both. Okay, okay, yeah. Just uh, something I found interesting. Yeah. It's, it's true, it's not necessarily a community, but it's also, it follow it, it has a lot of the community aspect. Yes. Yes. So yeah. So so this is this is a whole spectrum. Uh, and and the, the, from my experience, you know, some people fall into an environment, and and then they're critical about what this environment is. Uh, the the whole point here is that there's plenty of environments. So <laughs> just yeah. find your own environment somewhere. And um, if you're a Bitcoin user, for example, um, you know you take the utility of having some system of exchange, but you don't care who's mining Bitcoin, uh, you, you know what I'm saying, or who's at the other end of your transaction. Um, so everything, you know, all the, any type of organization on the spectrum has its own raison d'etre and should be respected for what it is, uh, you know. But people get tied up into, ah, you know, they criticize, this is like too cultish, or on the other side, this is too impersonal. You know, I don't feel I can associate. Uh, a big one is uh, a big one is about resources, and and yeah, this is a really big one. Um, again, the same structure, starting with theory, um, maybe going back to REA, the, the 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 modeling language and the ontology used for uh, economic processes. Um, how are resources defined within that 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 uh, framework? Um, and here you can, you know, there's different subtopics uh, after, after the general theory. You have human resources, okay? Um, and you can cut them into different categories, okay? These are, are they employees? Are they members of your f community uh, that you s create around your organization and your product, whatever, development? Um, uh, are they core member? Are they long tail? You know what I'm saying? You can, you can cut them in different ways, and and how to how to how to work with them? Um, are they volunteers? Are they contributors? Are they core members? Whatever you know. Uh, and 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 teach these collaborative entrepreneurs, the the students, um, about different categories of involvement and and how to deal with each category, right? Uh, for example, here you say, well, if you have a community, you need a community manager. Uh, and this is a particular skill. You know, companies is simple. You need a HR. Okay. And now HRs, they have different functions. Okay. And some of them, they also 
are big on culture and identity of the organization and the organized parties and mixers and all these type of things. Um, but I think it gets more complex when you have a, a collaborative venture, right? Um, then assets, going into material assets, virtual assets, and non-tangible assets. Uh, you know, material assets, it's the stuff that you use, uh, might be a physical space, might be tools and materials. You know, and so, you know, you're getting into tools, right? How do you, how do you, how do you manage these material assets? Uh, virtual assets, websites, uh, you know, whatever you use in the, in, in the digital world. Um, how, how do you manage those uh, also? And non-tangible assets is, uh, what is the reputation of your, of your venture? Um, uh, what is your strength or of, of, of what, what is the strength of the bonds that you have with other organizations around? Um, how cohesive is your community around if you have a community of, of innovators? Um, so these are like non-tangible, non-tangible um, assets that you can nurture and improve or, you know, manipulate and shape and, you know, engineer and so on and so forth. A big, big topic here is property regimes. Uh, because a traditional entrepreneur, you know, they see themselves as um, they, they're, they're fixated on proper, private property. Or in the case of co-op, common property or shared property. Okay. But in the case of a collaborative enterprise, I think um, people have to dive deep into property regimes and uh, be conscious about uh, what they use and who it belongs to. Um, and um, for example, you know, um, the venture could take, uh, could start within a shared space like a fab lab or, or, or co-working space or a, or, or a maker space, okay? In that case, um, the, the space is a community space. Uh, might be a shared space and they could be involved in the maintenance of this space. Um, so they're not owning the space but they're sharing the space and they're probably part of the non-for-profit or co-op that manages the space. So in some sense the space is theirs but it's not theirs. Okay. Um, whereas when you have a startup and you rent a, a, a space for your startup, you know, you, you don't own it but you own the activities inside and, and you can decide whatever you do there. <clears throat> Same thing for the equipment. If you're in a, in a, in a, in a shared environment, um, the 3D printer that you use to do your designs might not be yours. Might be private property belonging to some individual that shared the space or might be some communal property within that thing, right? So, so the, the whole idea here is that how do you integrate different properties regimes within your venture, meaning you don't have to own everything. As you're creating a, an enterprise, you don't have to go for funding and, and rent the space fully for yourself and buy, it, uh, buy a, a, a projector and, and buy 3D printers and buy computers and, and own it as an enterprise. That's what the collective does. Well, this is what community, yes, this is what collaborative communities do, right? Um, so, so, so the whole thing here is, don't think about your venture as a box that contains everything you need, okay, in a sort of private property regime, okay? Um, think of your assets um, as access to use. Some of them you might own, and maybe it's good for you to share in exchange of getting access to some other things. Um, some of them might be communal, some of them might be shared through other, you know, different types of, of arrangements. Um, so again, the notion of openness here, but when it, it applies to resources, right? Uh, you, you're not building a box with stuff inside. Um, you're actually part of an environment that provides you access to a lot of stuff that you need. So how do you compose with all these different property regimes within your processes, right? Um, and then tools to manage all these things, okay? Um, if you're part of an environment of shared assets, um, the shared thing, the shared 3D printer, 
it's not in your inventory as an asset belonging to your company. But it might be in your inventory as an asset that you can have access to according to certain rules. So your inventory is not just inventory of, of what you own. It's inventory what you can access to. And this, the tools that you use to manage you know, your activities you know, should allow for the management of resources that you have access to. So it's, it's, I think the emphasis here is put on, on access rather than, than owning, right? And how do you manage a, a, a constellation of things that you touch and use okay, that, that have different property regimes? You see what I'm saying? With NRP? NRP, yes. So NRP is, uh, is a software that allows you to manage resources and processes. Network it's resource? Network, planning, network resource planning system, okay. NRP. So it's like an ERP for corporations or for companies, traditional companies, made for networks. And the NRP allows management of assets in different property regimes. Okay, so it's a, it's, it's a more, this is, this is what you can do. It's, it's a more flexible tool that allows you to exist, but also coexist with other types of organization or in, in environments where things are shared. Okay, so it's a tool that allows you to manage assets that are shared in a network. And Yes, always evolve because somebody might bring something else in the, that environment. You might bring a TV and say, I had a TV in my basement, I'm not using it, I'll bring it there. Um, it's still mine, but you guys can use it. According to need or an opportunity. Yes, and, and in that case, this, this new TV that you bring from your basement is logged into some system to say, Jean owns this thing, so it's private property, but it, it, it allows people to use it. So it's in some sort of inventory with some rules of access, okay? Um, and an enterprise that is hosted by this environment, by this makerspace, let's say, can use it. They don't have to buy a TV anymore, and they, they can use it. So they can also list it in their own inventory, but not as something that they own. It's not, a, it's not an asset. If they're bankrupt tomorrow, nobody's going to come and, and take your TV from them. You see what I'm saying? Because the TV is your property. So what are the tools that allow us to manage shared assets? You see? Uh, so not everybody has to buy a TV in their own little space, but we can have shared stuff. We can mutualize, mutualization. Okay, we can mutualize stuff. So that's the NRP. It's, it's one of the tools that you can use to, to do that, right? So talking about resources again, human resources, um, assets, material, virtual, and non-tangible, property regimes, I think it's a, it's, it's a good discussion to have. Just to, put, just to get people outside of the box, you see? And, and with that, you tell people that this brings a complexity, okay, of managing shared assets. Mm -hmm. But the advantage is, the flip coin is that you don't have to buy all that stuff. You don't have to buy the whole inventory that you, are, uh, do you need to do your development. You see, so, so there is a disadvantage of managing a complexity. You need better tools. Tools are starting to exist now, okay? And the advantage is that you can really accelerate your growth because you don't need all that money to, uh, or all that you know, financial, uh, the cash, uh, to buy everything you need, okay? By the way, I think I have a way A box, yeah. Um, and you know, uh, talk about material assets, you know, uh, and digital assets, designs and, and designs as examples of uh, digital assets and prototypes as designs as examples of material assets. And again, designs, you can you can think about the property regimes of, of designs. Um, you know, the they can be treated as intellectual property owned by the collaborative venture, or they can be treated as commons. Okay, and thinking about resources, it's also a, a strategy, okay, that is, this, we should probably add the term strategy here somehow. Um, uh, somehow regime, somehow. Property regime, 
right? So where do you where do you position yourself when it comes to all these assets? You know, between private, shared, communal, non-dominium, yeah. and and why? The, the the when you go when you go into strategies, why? Right? It's why do I put my designs out there as open source designs and not keep them? Uh, within a closed space within the organization. There's a strategy there. Maybe because I want to build a community of innovators around me. So Adafruit, if we go back to Adafruit example, right, their designs are open source, which allows people to see what the company is trying to do, uh, take these products, modify them, and allows them to innovate. Right? And that goes into a feedback loop. Okay? Uh, back, to the, back to Adafruit, back to the company. Um, so, so there's a strategy component. Why, why, why do I treat these type of resources as shared resources or commons or whatever, you know, and not, why, why should I buy a 3D printer and not use the shared 3D printer? Why should I put my designs as creative commons and not treat them as intellectual property? You see, there's, there's a whole strategy here that, you know, uh, goes into your whatever business idea. And, and the course is not to project uh, one particular way of doing it, but through these courses, through some type of exercises, you know, um, just surface this kind of um, strategic, strategic thought and have people select where they, put, where, they, where they position the dial between openness and transparency and, and sharing uh, rather than owning, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a dial there, and, mm -hmm. and you have all these constellation of things that you use and you produce, so how do you categorize them and what do you position the dial for every type of it, right? Uh, it's this one here. So yeah, these are the tools for, for working. Uh, another, I think this is the last one, right? So yeah, so, <clears throat> so equations, yes. This would be the last course, um, the last session of, of this course. Again, starting with the theory, and this is a big one. This this might require one, or two or, or three sessions. You mean this is like the final project in a sense? Is this somehow? Well, the, the course, the course uh, stimulates entrepreneurs to think about all these aspects of an enterprise. This and is where they would apply it. Well. And no, operations is 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 it's part of uh, it's part of. Uh, um, internal operations of the organization actually uh, when you take a course in entrepreneurship they usually finish by operations um, an example of operation is uh, uh, manufacturing you know how do you manufacture stuff how do you sell stuff uh, how do you how do you manage your inventory how do you manage your supply chain right these are operations um, so so again we start by by introducing what operations are and then talk about planning, uh, talk about outreach, which is an operation. You know, planning is one thing. Outreach is an operation. Innovation and development is an operation. Production is an operation. Um, transactions. And then the tools, uh, a reflection about the tools that uh, are used to do all that. Okay. Um, outreach comes back, which is very important. Uh, it's very important for getting collaborators in, getting people contributing to your venture, but also getting people to know your product. Okay, so again, this, this, this tool um, is opening in, in, in both sides. Innovation and, and development, I think that's a big discussion to have and talk about innovation strategy. Okay. Um, how much are you going to, are you going to in, into open source development? So, here you can talk about open, open source development, open science, open innovation versus closed development and intellectual property. Where do you put the dial? Okay, as an entrepreneur, uh, do you want to keep something proprietary or do you want to, what is your innovation strategy? Okay, and, and we can go and find examples on the internet, for example, IBM, uh, or I think over their entire history, they spent $2 billion on open source development. Um, and, um, and you have, you know, Facebook and Google, and you know they they spend a lot of money in open source development. Um, take Tesla for example. You know they open their patents for cars, and yet they keep the patents for batteries. Um, so you know 
there's an innovation strategy here, okay? If we take the case of Tesla, is they don't want to be a car company, they want to be a utility company. They want to sell energy storage. They don't want to sell cars. So by opening, by open sourcing the car, they're actually creating a market of users. So you mean anybody can enter the design and produce something? Yes, a lot of aspects of Tesla, you know, they're, they're, they were open source because um, there is no market for their batteries. How do you create a market? Well, help people build stuff that run on batteries. Mm -hmm. And they don't make money, they're not, they don't see themselves as a car company. They don't make money on selling cars, okay? But they created a nice car to give a sort of a push and enthusiasm, and then they said, here's my designs, why don't you try to improve them? And then you have all these other companies selling cars, but they're, the, they're, they're positioned at the core of it, which is selling batteries. And this is where they're gonna make their money, right? <clears throat> so, so, so there's a strategy here. You open source the car to create a market. That's the strategy. Why do you open source? To create a market. Why? Because your product is not the car, it's the battery. And this is what you keep secret. Okay? Um, so, so this is where they place the dial. Well, like Google is never going to give away its search engine, right? <laughs> yes. But, but, but Google gave away a lot of stuff. And, and, and Google invested a lot of money in Mozilla Firefox, for example, and out of that came their, um, their, their browser, um, Chrome. Okay, so from their experience with the Mozilla community, they created Chrome. Um, so, so there's, a, you know, they, why Google created Android. And now Android is, you know, uh, it's king in, in, the, in the mobile industry, right? And Yes. But it's more, it's more people-oriented, Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so through Android as an operating system, they can they can sell their their apps, right? Um, so so there is there is a, there is an open there is an innovation strategy that, that they follow there too. Um, if you take if you go back to Adafruit example, um, you know, their products are open source because. Um, it's through this transparency um, of the designs that they create this innovative community and they can keep up with innovation and validate their new products uh, and, and the result is 700% growth sustained through three years. Okay, so, so it's, 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 it seems to work for them. Okay, um, so essentially they're turning open, the open source aspect of their products into speed of innovation and growth. Okay, that, that's, that's, what, that's what they're able to do. Um, okay, <clears throat> speed of innovation and growth. Yes. So, so that, that's a big thing, part of, the, part of the operations. You know, when you think about operations, um, when it comes to innovation and development, we have to dive deep into uh, innovation strategies and get people off from the knee-jerk idea that, oh, I might have the coolest product and might be the next um, Steve Jobs and I have to protect my ideas because other people are stealing it. It's just to open them to other models and say, here are some very successful uh, hybrid models and even the big giants you know, are engaging in some type of hybrid models too. So. Some type of what? Hybrid models, meaning hybrid models. Hybrid business models where they integrate right. a lot of collaboration right. and, uh, yeah, through open source and open innovation. Um, transaction is a very is a very technical one. You know, um, you can cut it into inward transactions: the supply, the donations, the lease, the contributions. Um, then outward transactions: sales, distribution, services and internal transaction, allocation of resources, property regime transfer, um, and uh, redistribution. Okay, uh, meaning, you know, um, redistribution of resources, you have a lot of contributors, you have community of innovators, how do you give them something back? You know, how do you reward them that these are, these are part of uh, transactions? Or if, you, if you're using some asset that is shared, uh, that asset might become property of someone or vice versa. Somebody brings, Jean brings a TV to Sensorica Lab and then says, this is my property, you guys can use it. And at some point Jean says, 
you know what, I'm going to just give it to the community. Like, forget about me. Just use it the way you want it. I, I don't want to claim this object anymore. That's a transfer property, but it's a transaction. It's an internal transaction. So, <clears throat> so you, the tools that you use, because the tools is, a, is, is the last one, the tools that you use, you know, have to be able to deal with all these type of transactions. And your collaborative venture becomes more complex because you're adding new types of transactions. Okay, normally within an organization, things are simple. Everything belongs to the organization. When you walk into... The, the environment, the space, the physical space of a company, you know, everything belongs to the company. So you don't have to deal with all these things. Um, the redistribution is simple. It's the salary model. You employ people and you pay them a certain amount of money per month. Uh, and so on and so forth. The allocation is very simple. Uh, meaning you have managers that decide how to use their budget in, in, in projects. Whereas here you might have people... Uh, or even the community involved in allocating some uh, some resources, saying, uh, "Do you think this project is is worth more than the other one, or it's better than the other one?" So that's about it for the course. And and uh, yes, and um, I put three slides here of some recaps, which is the important concepts that come uh, when you think about collaborative ventures and these are dials okay these are things that you can adjust meaning you know think about transparency access to information to, you know when when we think about resources like designs um, how transparent are they how 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 much access people that have nothing in common with or they're not involved in what we do how much access they have to see what we do, to look at the designs, to look at the projects, to look at who's doing what, and so on and so forth. So that's a dial. So it's it's a sort of a you know you can you can place your you can place your intensity of transparency based on your vision of of your collaborative venture, right? Openness is the same thing. How much access do I give to particip uh, for participation to uh, to outsiders? Uh, how fast can someone integrate our process? How fast can someone come and give me some feedback on um, a, a product or, or service that I provide? And how can I integrate this individual into operations? Okay, so if you look at back to Adafruit, uh, if you look at Adafruit development, um, they hire from their community. The people that they hire come from their community. So they have this community of consumers, people buy their products, they play with it, and then they, you know, they might find bugs and they might propose some fixes or they might propose totally new products with new features. Mm -hmm. And their power users of these communities that the company then hires. You see, so, they, so when you talk about openness, um, it's not totally open, meaning you're not part of the community and through a reputation system, you force your way into the company where you, you know, it's not a purely meritocratic system. If you prove yourself into the community, you automatically have a job. Okay, you still have to go through a hiring process, but, but you're picked up, you're cherry picked by the HR department of the community, of the, of the company, because they see you as a very proactive member of the community and they propose a job for you. Um, yeah, so transparency, openness, we all, we all know these concepts. Uh, stigmergy, it comes a lot. It's like, as a, as, a, as a collaborative entrepreneur, uh, how do you create tight coordination through signaling within your organization? Okay, and this goes back to operations, this goes back to the, the tools that you have, uh, this goes back to ethics and culture of work, uh, you, you know what I'm saying? And also uh, synergies, so it's another important concept. This is just a short list of concepts. Uh, and. The idea is that we might present them at the beginning of the course and then see them appearing throughout the course. So give like a lexicon at the beginning and, and you know, um, maybe instead of just having three words describing transparency, have a little paragraph about transparency and how you see transparency in different types of organizations. Like open source communities, they're highly transparent. Uh, they're, 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 they're very open, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then you can give the... The opposite example. 
uh, synergy. I think I think synergy comes comes as as a uh, skill. Uh, creating synergy within an organization comes as a skill for collaborative entrepreneurs. Um, Stigmergy is more about the structure. It's more about the tools that you use, um, and uh, about the work culture that you put into your organization. Um, but synergy is really it's really something that people do uh, when they see connections. You know, there is no automated system to see strong connections among different you know initiatives. Uh, it requires human beings, and people should connect these things together. Emergence and self-organization, um, that's, that's another important concept that always comes, uh, you know, move away from command and control, top-down structure, um, push innovation towards the edges of your organization, uh, allow even people from outside to propose ideas and, you know, um, contribute to, uh, to your venture. Um, in a sense, that, you know, how do you create a dynamic and adaptable structure? Right. So they put them in that in that frame of mind, um, move them away from rigid structures. But this is not a complete list. Huh? Well, we should uh, we should add more. Uh, if you have some if you have some suggestions, we uh, we can we can add them. Um, some of the skills of collaborative entrepreneurs, and again, um, maybe these these will be disseminated throughout the the, the course. Um, or maybe we should have just one discussion about soft skills, um, manage complex dynamical systems, uh, crowd-based processes, um, feel the crowd, um, being able to engage the crowd, okay, instead of thinking about a small group of colleagues uh, that you know and you have clear personal relationships, uh, how do you deal with a, a crowd which is like a cloud? Meaning, you know, um, it's an aggregate of individuals with emergent properties. You don't talk to the crowd as I talk to a friend in, 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 in the office. You see what I'm saying? You don't engage and motivate the crowd as you engage and motivate someone in the office. So that the collaborative entrepreneur has to be Almost like a politician, you know what I'm saying? A politician speaks to the crowds, okay? He wants, he wants the vote, okay? And, and he tries to <laughs> feel the sensitive chords within the crowd, you know? It's feel the vibe of the crowd, okay? And their speeches, you know, are crafted for crowds, not for individuals, you know? A politician would speak differently with you in a meeting, right? So, so that kind of skill that goes into the collaborative entrepreneur, uh, because the whole idea here is to uh, engage people to collaborate and also uh, create some sort of bonds with users and, and, and consumers and create this middle ground of prosumers, right? Um, but it's a numbers game. That's, that's the whole point, it's a numbers game. Well, even when you do a crowdfunding campaign, when you talk to the crowd to crowdfund your project, it's not the same as you're sitting down with a VC face-to-face -face in a room talking about your project. It's not the same approach. It's not the same language that you're going to use. It's not the same tactics that, that you're going to use in your communication. I uh, think large scale. Uh, this is, you know, it goes a little bit with the crowd, uh, but, you know... <coughs> Whatever happens among individuals, small scale, has a different dynamic, but when you address large systems, large crowds, you know, there is emergent properties of these things. And, um, and yeah, politicians, they can think large scale. What is the impact if I vote this way or the other way? You know what I'm saying? Uh, asking that question is very different than saying, um, how is uh, Jean or... Uh, um, uh, I don't know, Bruce uh, going to see my decision uh, if I vote this way or the other way. You know, it's a very different question than asking how is the support of my constituency going to change uh, because the crowd has an emerging property. Right? So think, think large scale. What is the effect, large scale effect of my actions as, a, as an entrepreneur on the whole ecosystem at once? Uh, um, 
you know, think large scale, large scale effects. Socialize your work, meaning you always have to engage the crowds. So, so <clears throat> the collaborative entrepreneur, I think that the soft skill is to be able to be a little bit extroverted, right? It's, it's to be able to uh, use social media to communicate problems, excitement, um, um, to propose new initiatives, uh, to, to, in, to engage the crowd rather than just, you know, uh, talking to an individual and having the message trickle down through command and control or, you know, command, you know, the, the, the structure, right, the hierarchy. Um, you don't pass the message to your vice president and they pass it to the directors and then it finally reaches uh, the workers, okay? It's what Donald Trump does, okay? You take, you go on Twitter and you, and, and you, and you speak to the entire population. Okay, it's like sort of bypassing all the traditional communication channels, right? So a collaborative entrepreneur, uh, if we want to continue the metaphor with uh, politicians, you know, it's, it's somebody that it's a little bit extroverted and, and can, can speak to the entire ecosystem uh, at once um, instead of passing the message through, through simple channels. Um, it has to be a collaborative personality, uh, somebody that uh, likes sharing, um, and a helper, facilitating and, and you know coordinating activities, um, and also an animator to put to put soul into what it does, right? Um, and uh, another soft skill is to create attractors. It's again tied into thinking large scale and complex dynamical systems. Um, it's to create attractor means how do you get pe how do you how do you get people like what you do and have them choose to become a contributor to what you do instead of you spending efforts to get people to come to you and then lock him in through a, some sort of a contract, work contract or job contract or something like that, right? Um, how do you get people to stick around what you do as 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 an entrepreneur? Um, <clears throat> because they because they like it because they find something in it more than just money because they find a purpose because they find a place to learn because they find a place to network because they like the vision and the mission of the whole thing and all that stuff right? And you can see that um, in uh, um, some examples, um, Makerbot in the beginning. It was a powerful attractor. It sucked in the best minds in 3D printing. So MakerBot, the company that sells 3D printers, created in the RepRap open source community as a very small startup. Uh, and at some point, they were crowded in a space. They didn't have place to work. So many engineers, they came and they were working like low wage salaries just because they were so enthusiastic. They're going to change the world. They're going to bring this third industrial revolution, 3D printing, you know, all that stuff. So much enthusiasm. People just flocked in. They they sucked all the brains, uh, you know, into this into this venture. And then, and then the problem is. So that was that was the attractor period of MakerBot. And then the 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 startup became a corporation. It got you know venture capital in. They they closed the product. They you know they didn't stick with with the initial culture and identity and mission. And it just became a normal growing company driven by investment. And then um, all these brains that were there before, they just went out. They just dissipated. Uh, so, you know, so this was, this was the, the, the glory years where, when, when MakerBot was an attractor and then followed by, you know, the disaster where all the brains went away. Um, so, bringing these examples into the course just so show people a collaborative entrepreneur you know should be should be able to keep that sort of attraction uh same type of phenomena that happened at uh, at this company uh find and build synergies uh, it's it's a it's a more of a skill uh, we, you know, it was part of the important concepts here yeah, yeah i see those under the same category that is introduced in the beginning and then keeps popping up as you said as a reminder, during exercises. Um, so you, you disseminate them, yes, okay. I, 
Oh, in the uh, type of collab uh, entrepreneurs? The type of entrepreneurs in the beginning? Uh, um, yes, not only like the type, even as, uh, <coughs> there could be like a section for the entrepreneur, but uh, this is this comes a bit after. And I, I see this as like under the title something around collaboration ethics and slash collaboration practices, where, where this is introduced in parallel with like uh, what is peer review as an example, or, or constructive criticism. Or I, these uh, practices slash ethics that that needs to happen or happen often yes, facilitate yes. the whole thing so as, a, as a, it's part of literature review but also it kind of pops up with during exercises kind of as reminders yes 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 I, I think during the exercise the exercise is, is is a is a is a time when after you absorb information, you go and do your introspection and look yeah. at yourself as an entrepreneur, but also at what you want to create. Uh, and everybody has its own case and, and think on their own case, dive deep into their own case. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's a great place for them to do the introspection and say, am I able to, you know, am I extroverted? Am I able to cope with uh, the crowd, uh, engage the crowd? Uh, Am I able to create and sustain an attractor, mm. or you know, um, do I have the these soft personal skills and maybe personality traits, right? To yeah, to be somebody that gathers people around, or and even or, if it's not there, how can it be somehow closer? <laughs> do I know somebody that is charismatic and and can take that role? You see what I'm yeah. saying? Or how can I fill that hole? Yes. Yeah. How can, how can we do something about it? Yeah. Okay. Actually, there's something missing in the presentation that I, in the course, talking about structure, talking about rules. <coughs> I, I'm going to put that in. Rules. This is a big thing. Okay. Um, I had it in mind at some point, but I forgot. Yeah, like a list of major roles that that need to be there somehow. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Like leadership roles. Yeah, you can also uh, you can also um, be very practical. To us. Yeah, it should be more a reflection. What type of roles do you think you would have in your organization? And and take a few examples. And uh, yeah. you know when you look at stuff uh, organizations like Adafruit for example which is the high, this hybrid organization sometimes they they have these new job positions that are uh, you don't see in traditional companies or if you look at Inspiral also they have these yeah. you know um, very weird names you know roles uh, that they created because you know they decided they needed it yeah, uh, there to, to custom, custom stuff yes yes there's also always an essential uh, roles yeah, so maybe the idea is to give some examples. Mm -hmm. um, see if we can extract a pattern uh, yeah. s somewhere. You know, community manager, I mean, that's an established role. Mm -hmm. Any company that has an opening uh, or, you know, some sort of a community of users or innovators or, you know, early adapters, they do have community managers. So, uh, so that became a prominent role. Uh, everybody knows uh, that that's, that's important. 